our speaker to today uh, is Andres Vilevesic. And Andres, it's, uh, it's great to have you again at CUNY. I was actually remembering uh, your last talk and how nice it was to be at the Grad Center and all that. Um, so Andreas uh, is from the National uh, University of Columbia uh, at Bogota, and I am very glad that he chose uh, this topic to, sp to speak about because this is something that I've been very interested in lately, uh, uh, which is abstract logics. And the title of his talk is Two, Two Logics and Their Connections with Large. I am very excited about your talk, Andreas. Go, go right ahead. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you all for, for, for being here. And thank you, Vika, for, for the invitation to, to speak in the seminar. Okay, so uh, as I was saying before, um, when, I, when I received the invitation, I, I thought, well, you know, by coincidence, somehow, I was actually uh, reading a version of a, a paper by Vika and uh, three other authors. So Stamatis Dimopoulos, uh, Will Boni, and Menachem Magidor. It is, uh, you know, uh, very much a set theory paper. There are a lot you know, there is a, uh, there are, of course, many uh, logics, but there are, of course, large cardinals in that uh, paper, as you can expect, uh, you know, from the names of the, at least three of the authors, or not really, you know, the, the four authors in, in, in many ways. And uh, it somehow um, follows a long story that uh, was, uh, you know, it, it is very much related to Menachem uh, Magidor's early uh, study of strongly compact cardinals in their case. And uh, this is a subject that has always fascinated me in many ways ever since uh, you know, my own work in, in large cardinals many years ago. And uh, somehow I, I started to see connections with these logics and uh, that I, I want to speak about today. So I decided, uh, Vika, when I got your invitation that I should try to address the seminar in a way that would be you know, meaningful specifically for this particular seminar for, for the New York uh, set theory seminar. But, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, well, since we have two sessions, uh, I will concentrate today not on any large cardinals or uh, uh, forcing uh, at all, but really the setup. So the setup really requires uh, some explanation and some time. Actually, the setup is related to something I spoke about uh, in, in uh, the Graduate Center, but really at the Graduate Center uh, two years ago, that work was beginning back then. I could never have, have you know, imagined all the connections with large cardinals that I uh, and uh, that you know that you want, I plan to speak about now. But many things also happened in between. So between late 2019 and it was you know almost right before the end of the time when we could travel before this, and now. Um, lots of things that ha have happened. But so may maybe some of you still remember that Blackboard lecture at the Graduate Center that they gave, I think, in November of 2019. So the session two, you know, the session one, sorry, would be about the two logics. And the, se the second session would be about the connections with large cardinals and forcing. So let's consider this sort of general question. Uh, I see here people who might uh, have different answers to this question. And, but this is a motivation. So when is a logic appropriate for moral theory? Of course, some, some, some people could say, well, when you have, you know, like first order, the compactness theory, and that's, and then work. But that's kind of a reductive answer. And uh, we want to look at it, you know, in a more general way. We know there are many logics and maybe some of these logics have properties, internal properties, structural properties that somehow make them more um, good to develop some model theory. So, you know, my first answer would be, well, logics that are similar to L omega omega, the first order logic, or maybe continuous L omega omega, the continuous version of, you know, what is now called continuous model theory. There is a lot of model theory being done there after, you know, it is really based on work by Chang and Kiesler from the 1960s, but it really re-emerged you know, with a lot of strength during the 21st century so far. So these logics have Lohenheim's column theorems, they have compactness, they have interpolation, and uh, we could say, well, just take any logic that has all these things, but unfortunately, we know this, this cannot be a case outside of L omega omega. However, one, one would like to you know, do logic like uh, Kiesler, 
was doing at the end of 1960s, early 70s, in an omega one omega. It is very natural. There are many, uh, you know, many uh, aspects of mathematics or many parts of mathematics that may be formalized quite well in an omega one omega. But it's a very easy exercise to see that compactness fails. So you will have to do your model theory in a different way. A lot of things can be done still in L omega one omega. So, you know, uh, many, many things say, may happen there. Of course, there are the logics L kappa lambda. And as we know, and especially people, you know, have mentioned here uh, in this seminar, they know how strongly this depends on the properties of kappa and of lambda. So, uh, and this is somehow more related to what we'll see later. Now, my co-author of one of the parts that I will speak today, Yoko Vanenen, has this uh, view that infinitary logic may still serve, even if it is not very good as, you know, uh, per se for model theory, as a kind of yardstick for model theoretic constructs, because it permits fragments of model theory and usually is preserved under reasonable forcing. And this question is preserved under reasonable forcing is also at the heart of um, uh, the four outer paper, you know, because I'm, I think I'll just go by the, the initials, but I, it's V, uh, V, uh, VM, v, v, G, M. Okay, anyway, so, and more recently, following Mackay and Kuker's work, this is very recent and very iffy, uh, as I see it at the moment, Spindola, uh, in the, he was in the Czech Republic, back then, now he's in, in, a, in the Réunion, he has captured lambda categoricity of L kappa kappa in terms of categorical logic. So this really goes in several different directions. One could say, well, do categorical logic in some sense, look at the classifying topos of logic and so on. I won't say anything else about this line, but it is another line that may be related to things that we do here. So let me, I have copied this map from Venani, of various infinitary logics. You will recognize some of them so perhaps it's important to notice that L omega omega, first order, is at the intersection of two important areas. So logics that have compactness and logics that have good interpolation properties. To the right, you have cardinality quantifiers mixed with cofinality quantifiers. I won't go into, into, into those right now. At the top, you have L2, for second order logic. And that usually is very bad for model theory may, for many for many reasons. Maybe you know the most you know, naively, at least the most immediate reason is that it gives too much information, so it doesn't really have a flexible model theory. Now to the left, you have all these all the omega one omega, L kappa omega. There's actually some noise. I don't know. Anyway, L kappa omega and variants of them. And then L kappa kappa, which for us is an important player in the, you know, uh, at the corner. And we'll be essentially looking at this kind of cloud in between L kappa omega and L kappa kappa for the following reason. So essentially our logics, our two logics will be placed in that corner, in that little, you know, upper left corner, and they will be called L1 kappa and L1 C kappa. L1 kappa has a, has a very illustrious history. It appeared in 2012 in a paper of Schellach, and uh, it has a very nice feature, or not nice, depending on how you view things. It doesn't have any syntax. So wait a minute, what do you mean? A logic with no syntax, then what can you do? And this is what we, I will try to describe in a moment, in what sense I say it has no syntax. It is not completely true that it has no syntax, but it doesn't have any recursive syntax where you can point, pinpoint you know, the way you construct formulas and sentences is by induction as we are used for many of our logics, perhaps not all of them. So that corner that appeared here is, you know, here you have four logics. We'll speak today about two of these logics. The other, or five logics really, yeah, yeah, four areas and five logics. The other three logics are kind of in the same neighborhood <clears throat> and they're interested, one of them interesting. One of them is connected with uh, abstract elementary classes. And the other one is, 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 is somehow uh, from the work of uh, Jamunia and Vanden. It is connected with uh, CARP's uh, systems. It is called chain logic. And uh, these arrows somehow you know, place the logics. So L1 kappa is at the center here. L1 C kappa, our second logic, would be a little bit below, but it has nice properties of L1 kappa, and it can be approached in a better way. And the earth, 
three logics that are there, you know, maybe some other day, but today and uh, next week, we'll focus on the, on the two logics, L1 kappa at the center and L1C kappa, a kind of smaller logic. Okay, the, there is a delta here, that's the connection between the two logics, and we explain that a little bit later. So let's recall or describe for you interpolation it's a very important model theoretic property that I think is, it's, is always worth looking at. So in 21, Malitz proved that uh, there is a Craig interpolation phenomenon uh, from L kappa plus omega in a larger logic. You have to go to L2 to kappa plus kappa plus. Let me explain what this means. So if you have some implication where phi is a tau one sentence in a vocabulary tau one, and psi is a tau two sentence. And both are in the small logic, so in L kappa plus omega. So we have some kind of implication. So imagine phi is about, I don't know, some ordered groups or something like that. So we have a language with order and uh, the group uh, operation. And psi is a field uh, sentence. So it also has the group operation, but it has something else. Then there is a question, well, do you really need all the you know, uh, ordered groups or what do you actually use from the ordered groups to prove something about fields? That's one way of seeing this. And then uh, in uh, here, the answer is, well, there actually is something in the common vocabulary in tau one intersect tau two that is responsible for this implication. So somehow the implication doesn't, I mean, there is something that only involves the common language, in this case, tau one intersect tau two. In my kind of a example, there is something purely group here, at, well, in the language of, of groups, at least, that somehow is, is the, the reason for this transfer. And uh, this is very important. This is also very important in like database theory and so on, where you have databases that somehow combine two different languages. And it is nice to know that uh, you can actually write some kind of database in the, in the, in the, in the common language that uh, is, is responsible for this transfer, transfer. Now, this phenomenon happens in first order logic in itself. So you don't have to go to a larger logic. It's a, it's a theorem by Craig. And uh, in, uh, in, in our case here, we have to go to a much larger logic. We have to go to L to the kappa plus kappa plus in order to find the interpolant. So you can find the interpolant, but there is a price to be paid. But you have to make you know, your sentence more complicated than uh, phi and psi. Okay, so you could say, well, fine, I, I got the interpolation. So Malitz's theorem is, is great and so on. But there is still this feeling, is there some kind of a logic that in itself has the, the ability to, to interpolate? So anyway, let me just quote here or mention that the original argument used consistency properties and there are proofs that use, you know, this is connected to separation properties in topology. Uh, this is connected to several different uh, phenomena that uh, maybe some, some of you uh, are much more familiar with than uh, what I am saying here. So there was this problem. Can we balance interpolation? So can you find some logic in between L kappa plus omega and L2 to the kappa plus kappa plus that is somehow, you know, uh, has interpolation in itself. Uh, the, there were some reasons for, for this problem. The, you know, you could ask this as some sort of a balancing question, but there are some additional reasons why one would like to have such a, a, a logic. These are more multi theoretic reasons. So in 2012, Scheller, well, he solved the problem, that problem, he solved that particular problem and uh, by you know, giving some logic that is called L1 kappa, but there are some, I mean, I mean the context is kind of specific here. So I will uh, say uh, a little bit about, you know, a few things about the context here, but this logic has interpolation. Now you could say, okay, fine. You solved uh, a, a nice difficult problem, but what um, emerged is a logic that has very peculiar properties. And this is what I want to, kind of a, uh, transmits to a kind of a, you know, you know, give to a, a description of why this logic L1 kappa is interesting, you know, beyond this solution of this problem. Um, as, so I will try, you know, to, to say at least why, why, why it is uh, you know, an interesting logic. And then later on, you know, next, next week, we'll do a variant of this logic 
that uh, has different theorems, but where kappa being a large cardinal becomes an interesting thing. So for today, kappa is quite uh, you know small in some sense. It has cofinality omega. It's a singular strong limit, so you know it could be something like a bet omega or something like that. So it is quite small in that sense, but uh, it has enough closure properties in a different sense. It has you know the singularity here has a sort of compactness that I think is related to singular compactness in some in some sense. And it is also related to SCH, if you want to look for more set theoretical flavor of this, of this kappa. And uh, it happens to be in between what would be like L kappa, kappa, L kappa omega to the left and L kappa kappa. So here I would like to write L kappa omega and here I'd like to write L kappa kappa. Uh, I have to pay a small price for that because normally the definition of these logics like L kappa omega or L kappa kappa works in a nice way when kappa is regular, but here kappa is singular. So instead of doing that, we or, or we can just call L kappa omega the union of all the logics L lambda plus omega for lambda less than kappa and the same thing to the right. So the union of all, of all, all the logics L lambda plus lambda plus for lambda less than kappa. This is just for the sake of a good definition of these logics. But anyway, it's, it's, it's really in between that area where we're trying to balance interpolation. There, there are some changes with respect to the original Malitz situation, but it is an interesting logic. And it is interesting for reasons that have to do with the, the model theory of abstract elementary classes. So if you wanted a kind of preposterous uh, uh, answer to the question, when is a logic good for model theory, one could say, well, look at some area where you already have some good model theory, like abstract elementary classes, there is a lot of stability theory. And now look, what is the logic of abstract elementary classes? And then it's a difficult question because normally abstract elementary classes are not presented uh, with an emphasis on their logic. They are presented with their emphasis on their model theory. So one question would be, well, what is really the logic that is governing these abstract elementary classes? And, but this is not something I will uh, speak about today, although I think it may appear uh, next week for the reason that I'm thinking. Anyway, if in addition, and look how things kind of um, begin to converge into different areas, if kappa is a fixed point of the bet function, then that logic, so it can be, uh, so, or, or, or in that case, I mean, not in addition, but in the case when kappa is a fixed point of the, of the, uh, of the bet function, yeah, uh, then the logic also has the Lindstrom type characterization as a maximal logic that has the interpolation plus a peculiar strong form of uh, undefinability of an order. Now, why do I mention here undefinability of an order? I could call this in a, in a way, you know, in a kind of a, a informal way, very weak compactness. So it's a compactness phenomenon. For us, it's normally, you know, it's an exercise. It's a very easy exercise that uh, with compactness, you cannot define well order. But then you can say, well, what happens if you just know you cannot define well order? How strong is that? And that turns out to be quite weak compared to full fledged compactness. Yet it is quite powerful, more theoretically. And it is quite powerful because if you know you cannot define well order, uh, the way these, the arguments work here, both theoretically, is you can actually build a lot of non-standard models, but not by applying compactness, but by using directly the undefinability of order in a way that I will uh, describe uh, a little bit later today. So in spite of not having compactness and not being able to you know, write a theory and uh, use you know, a, a typical compactness argument, you can just start building models and in a and, uh, and you can approximate non-standard phenomena by the undefinability of an order. And that's good enough for many constructions. So Lindstrom here would be for a combination of undefinability of an order as a kind of a remnant, very weak remnant of compactness, but still useful. And uh, uh, the interpolation phenomenon that uh, was at, you know, being described here. Now, the problem is that this logic from 2012 is not just given, you know, as usual, that uh, you just, uh, you know, build your sentences and say, oh, look, there is this quantifier, this and that. But you first declare what is the elementary equivalence relation 
Now, um, this is not very common, but here in this audience, there, there may be some other people, and this, you know, this will be a question from for me. But at the end of the lecture, to you, if uh, you have seen our logics, where you actually start by defining the elementary equivalence relation, um, I I was you know speaking to a mall theory uh, seminar describing some of the more uh, mall theoretic sides of this, and John Baldwin mentioned that uh, he remembered in Shellac's book uh, there was a logic that was defined in very in a very strange way. Try to capture the so-called DOP, dimensional order property, a, a very important uh, property connected to the main gap, and uh, it was not just you know like half a paragraph or something like that. And then Buscaren and uh, Ruszowski actually built a whole paper in 2006 around that logic, and that logic also has this kind of definition. But that's where the similarity you know ends, at least in, uh, in, in my perspective so far. So there are other logics that are like that, and you may know perhaps from somewhere else, but it is not very common because if you have an elementary equivalence relation, what can you do? Let us see. So it's important to say that, and this is what we will do with pictures in a, in a moment, that the elementary equivalence relation is given by an Erinfoit Freise uh, like game. So I will describe the Erinfoit Freise kind of game, the variant on the Erinfoit. Again, uh, is the syntax of uh, of that logic, and there are you know at least two partial answers. One approaching from below, that's uh, the, what they work about here. The other one from above, that's you know, work joint work of Jamoni and Van Allen. And there is a, another one by Pelitskovich and uh, Van Allen. So anyway, we will focus on, on the on the first one later. So let me describe Schiller's game. I will go back to his slide. I mean, just take a look at this slide. I want to single out some things, but I, I think this slide is very obscure. It's just a reduction of a, you know, like a two page definition in a, in a, in a, in a, in a paper by Schiller where, and what I will do in a moment is, I mean, don't, don't pretend to, to understand what the, what the game is, is being given here, but let me just say, two things just to remind you how things are. So we call the game G or funny G, beta, theta, M, N. So as you can expect, M and N are two models in some vocabulary and we want to compare them. So we want to, you have two players. One of the players, we call him uh, anti, anti isomorphism, the, you know, the destructor or whatever. And the other player, she's called easel. Isomorphism. So these are the, the two names, or you know, it could be Abelard and Heloise or whatever. And the two parameters, beta and theta, well, theta is a cardinality. And let me, I didn't write it here, but it's important to say theta is some cardinality less than kappa. And let's speak it right. And beta is some ordinal less than theta plus. This is important. I, I missed it in this uh, slide. So there are two parameters at play. Remember, we're trying to describe this logic L1 kappa, so we place ourselves below kappa with some cardinality theta, and we pick it regular, and then, or, well, uh, yeah, it, in all the important cases, it'll be regular, and beta is what will be called an ordinal flock. Now, let's forget about this slide. We just have, have from this slide that, it, you know, it looks like a, some kind of a Ernfoy Trice game, but let us see what really goes on here, and then, uh, I'll go back to, to this specific description. So you have two models. In principle, they could be you know, completely different and we want to compare them with this game that we call Schellach's game. So G, B, theta, M, N. And there is some ordinal beta. So in red, I put the, the moves by anti, so first player. So he plays an ordinal below beta. So beta zero is strictly below beta. And he plays on the left or on the right. This is a symmetric game, unlike some of the versions uh, that are in, in the paper I want to address uh, next week. So this A zero could be like here in M, or it could be, I mean, he, he gets to choose. And of course, since he's the anti-isomorphism player, he wants to isolate something that uh, he said, well, let me pick something 
that uh, I know doesn't have good counterpart on the other side. So ESO will be in trouble. And um, the only thing is the size of this A0 is uh, less than or equal to theta. So in principle, it could be up to theta. So he has a lot of you know power. It's a, in that sense, it's already different from the in for trace, but what you know the main difference appears now. Now ISO gets to partition that A0. So A0 will call it this challenge. And she gets to partition that A0 into omega many parts. So these are omega many parts. And then we put it in green. So her place it's in omega partition. Associations essentially will map all these things and assign numbers zero, one, et cetera, with the idea of trying to postpone difficult things. So she, she says, oh, wait a minute, I would be in trouble. There is something here that I may not know how to respond. So I will kind of you know, put it in some number that she considers big. Well, big here, of course, depends on what you want. But one thing that will happen at all the anti uh, moves is that an ordinal will be going down. Therefore, the gain is finite. In spite of you know there being all these theta and all these you know maybe large cardinals next week and so on going on, the gain is still finite because of the ordinal clock. Of course, if beta the ordinal clock is, is larger, the anti isomorphism player has uh, it, well it, it will be finite in the end, but he will have ways to kind of uh, delay the gain or or make the the gain last a little bit longer by playing with the structure of the ordinals. Uh, in spite of the fact that the gain will be finite, and um, she gets to partition. And the idea of the partition is that in the first move, she only has to respond to the first piece of the partition. She can, for, for the time being, she can ignore uh, the second piece, the third. So she, 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 she really has to give a partial isomorphism of the first piece into something in N. So next move is again uh, the first player. The anti isomorphism player has to play now beta one less than beta zero. So he's kind of you know, using uh, his clock and he has to provide a new, totally new challenge. Of course, he could replay the same challenge, but uh, that will, but you know, the, he has to find some kind of new challenge. Let me call it A1 on the right or on the left, M or N. And then ISO does the same thing. So she splits the challenge into omega many pieces. And now she has to respond, and this is where the, the thing becomes quite interesting. She has to respond to the first piece of the second challenge and to the second piece of the first challenge. So it is not that she could completely ignore A0, you know, even if she, you know, she realized that maybe there was some trouble brewing, you know, maybe here. So she put this you know, in, a, in the piece, say, I don't know, 1 million uh, or something. And maybe she considers that 1 million or 10 million is a, is, is a big number. So she says, okay, at least this will give you, you know, the chance. Uh, 10 million moves will have to be made before I really have to respond to this. But she will have to respond it at some point unless again, the, the game ends and it will end in some finite uh, uh, time. So you see, it's very much like the original Ernfeld Freise game, but now it has something that we call a de uh, delay. This is the core of a, of a long description that is happening here. So of course, in the third, you know, in the, in the next move, there'll be again an ordinal uh, going down, beta two. There'll be again um, a new challenge. And in the new, I, I don't have any more pictures here, but in the next stage, after uh, ISO splits this into omega many pieces, she'll have to respond to the third piece here by providing something isomorphic in this side, to the second piece here by providing some extension of the isomorphism. Everything has to be, you know, G0 and G1, they all have to be coherent as a partial isomorphism. And say this was the first piece here, she'll have to provide with answer of this. So, this is something that uh, is sometimes described by, by, by Schellach as postponing your debt. So you somehow, you know, like, like took a loan and, and then you somehow mortgage your, your loan in a way. And uh, since, you know, the, the world will end in a, in a finite amount of time, 
if you do if you, if, if they allow you to postpone for mega many steps your your loan then maybe you can put the payments that you know will be difficult maybe for like a million years from now or something like that this is somehow what is happening here in between these two structures and so let me yeah i don't know if if you want to take a look at this uh, slide this slide is roughly saying exactly the same things that are being but i think the description that is being given by the picture i think it is nicer so once we have this definition of a game we can say well m is beta theta equivalent to n if and only if iso has a winning strategy in the game and by the way this game is determined and it is determined because it is fine it just uh, uh, and um, uh, there is a problem that uh, this definition is not necessarily transitive. So I said equivalent, but you don't necessarily have an equivalence relation. If you have a strategy, you know, M and, and then some N prime, if uh, ISO has a strategy for the delayed gain for the first and the second and the second and the third, it doesn't necessarily translate into a strategy to win the comparison between the first and the third. So that's very bad. That's a very bad feature, I think, of this game. And uh, so Schellach defined these you know, three lines here as the transitive closure of the, of the relation. And then, of course, you have now an equivalence relation. And then a sentence is a union of less than or equal to beth, beta plus one of theta many equivalence classes of this equivalence relation for some theta less than kappa. So there are lots of things kind of going on here. So remember, we are defining L1 kappa. Remember, you play, you, you do the comparisons for theta less than kappa. I said regular, but it's, yeah, but it's, it's, it's not really that important. And then you do also the comparisons with clocks beta less than theta plus, you take uh, the, the transitive closure of these, uh, this relation, and then you get the equivalence relation. And when you have all these classes, then of course you could say, well, okay, let me suppose that all structures in some vocabulary tau have, you know, that um, the equivalence relation, so these are the classes by the equivalence relation, beta, theta. So if, it had, if you have two structures here, M and N in the same class, they are kind of elementary equivalent, at least for the game. The game sees them as, as the same uh, uh, structure or, or you know, as related structures. And then we want to say what they call a sentence will be any small union of things of this kind. And that will be a sentence. So you see how you know untreatable it looks, um, you know, at this stage, at least compared with a normal definition of a logic. And this was the reason for this uh, work with uh, Venon that uh, I will now describe. That's the second logic. That would be like a version of this, but with not, I think much nicer uh, syntax, without all the good properties, but enough of the good properties. And so I will try to describe what are the good properties of these of this logic. Okay, so we go back, you know, for a game. I don't know if there are any questions about the game at this point. This I, is I, I actually have a small question just about the structures. So, so the structures M and N, and uh, you know, the basically what these equivalence classes are made up of. Uh, they are uh, like uh, what kind of how many predicate symbols and so on uh, are they allowed to have? Less than kappa many or? Yeah, yeah, okay. uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, there is some kind of a one, one could do with a more than kappa many by doing approximations of the of the logic. That's a very important question and becomes a really central question when one wants to treat these things in you know put them in, in universes of set theory and start uh, doing uh, uh, you know looking for for a. Uh, elementary banks or looking for forcing extensions and so on. I have completely bypassed this question. And um, in cases where the language or the number of predicates and so on is larger than kappa, one can still, uh, in some cases, do approximations, but then it becomes much more uh, 
artificial at least for, for for that so let us stick with yeah uh, quick caveats. question quick question the beta ends are they decreasing yes 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 that's, a, that's an that's infinite a decreasing point. sequence of ordinals no finite no uh, the game is finite, it's finite. It's finite. Mm. ah oh i so thought fire, five... i thought iso just had to keep the game going forever oh it's a finite number of moves she has to make yeah, but she doesn't know how these many are in the beginning. So automatically, it will be finite. Now, um, you know, you, you could wonder if the game is finite, what is the real role of this ordinal clock? Because, I mean, what's the difference between having ordinal clock, say, omega, and say, omega plus omega, or, or something, you know, much larger, some ordinal that is much larger. And look at the, the, let me try to describe the comparison between omega and omega plus omega. So in omega, the anti-isomorphism player has to choose something less than omega. So let's suppose he chooses 17. That means that he only has 17 shots at cornering, uh, or you know, 16 shots remaining at cornering uh, the second player, because even if he wants to slow down the game, he'll have to choose 16, 15, and so on. And he and uh, what is the difference of playing with omega plus omega? Of course, you could say, well, in the end, it'd be fine. I mean, it's a, it's a increasing sequence of ordinals. But uh, let's suppose he starts with omega plus, I don't know, 17, or omega plus something. Well, he has to choose some finite number. But these 17 allow you to see how the other player is, is what is what she is doing. And at least he has 17 moves, or finite number of moves, where he can actually see how the other player uh, has done things. And at that point, you know, when he reaches omega, he will have to go down. But he, then he, he knows, he has a little bit more information, and he knows, well, maybe I now play, I don't know, 500,000 or something like that, because I need, I now know that with one, with, you know, 500,000 additional moves, I will be able to corner uh, the other player, Izo, into some place where she will not be able to, to respond. So that's somehow this sort of delay. So it is finite, but beta being larger, gives more, I mean, makes the game easier for the anti-isomorphism play. But the game is fine. That's a very important point. Okay, now we have this, yeah, uh, this is, you know, again, the same the definition of the L1 kappa sentences. And uh, so where is this logic? I mean, in principle, I just give you some game. How do I compare these with our logics? So there is a key lemma for, the second dominance. So I want to say that L1 less than or equal to theta is actually bounded by what would be L kappa kappa, kappa kappa. It is really bounded for theta. I mean, if we fix some theta, and by this, I mean, I, I only allow the game, you know, up to theta, then it is bounded by the union of all the logics L lambda plus lambda plus for lambda less than beta, beth theta plus. And the key lemma for this second uh, dominance of logics is that if two structures are elementary equivalent in the logic L beth, beta theta plus theta plus in, in, you know, in, the, in the big logic, if they are elementary in elementarily equivalent, then one can show that they are again equivalent in the sense of theta, you know, with the parameters that I am giving there. So what do we do? I mean, this is, this is, of course, a long proof. One has to do induction on beta less than theta plus, on beta less than theta, less than theta plus. And essentially, be, you know, building uh, winning states for the isomorphism player by knowing that in the larger logic, the two structures are uh, elementarily equivalent. But this will mean that making the separation in the, in the game logic would imply non-equivalence in the larger logic, and that that is this this dominance that is this first uh, dominant. So if you look, if you remember this picture of the uh, equivalence classes, the way we compare logic in, in the sense of the equivalence classes would be essentially saying that the element elementary equivalence in the larger logic is a is a is a finer is a finer uh, uh, equivalence relation than the original one. So yeah, I. I had this, this picture here, and I said what I call sentences here are these you know, units of bull classes. 
But if you know that you have some other logic or some other way of doing this, where you will be refining all of these classes, where the red equivalence relation will refine the original green equivalence relation, in the sense of the logic, that actually means that the, the, the green the the green logic is dominated by the red logic in that in that sense. And this is what happens here, but of course one has to do you know a, a long argument how how we built actually all of these uh, uh, strategies. Okay. The other dominos I don't say anything about it. It's kind of I mean the it's kind of simpler or it is kind of more direct. You essentially have to find a way to write anything you can express with L lambda plus omega. That's easier to, to express to find some, some uh, uh, sentence in the middle. But this kind of gives you a reason to, well, let's try to look for some kind of more some, uh, syntactic way of dealing with this. Let me just say that at least more theoretically, this is a crucial claim. This is not so crucial, I think, for the set theory, but let me mention it because I think what, this is what one wants with these logics. And if one is thinking about, uh, you know, collapsing or or playing with the with the universes, one has to be careful with this sort of thing. So, being closed and the ring of omega chains is something that, in first order, we know by you know by Tarski and and Watt and, and Walsh. And the, it, it's an it's, it's an extremely basic and important feature. But there are many logics that fail closure under unions of short chains. And in a way, short chains are much more the problem here than long chains as we will try to see. So anyway, given some omega sequence of tau structures that are all elementary in this stronger logic, so this delta here is some beth, uh, the union will be elementarily equivalent in our new logic, in our new logic, to each one of the stages. So maybe a way to say this or to, you know, like a blurb capturing this is to say that uh, the sentences are closed under unions of chains. Let me just quote and mention that uh, when kappa is a fixed point of uh, the bet function, this has a weak version of the downward Mollingham's column. So uh, here, it's not, it's not so important here. I know here there are some people who would like to know more of the details of this, but for what I want to this is something that we can somehow bypass in details. I will skip over two additional details because I want to give you the definition of the R logic. Uh, here is just a version, a way to write that well ordering is undefinable, but it is essentially that any time you have a model, you have an elementarily equivalent model that you know where, where the first model was well ordered, there will be some other model that will be elementarily equivalent where there will be a failure, a specific kind of failure of, of the will ordering. So it doesn't really matter so much the details here. I want to, to stress something uh, new here. Let me just mention, just, just to close this part, that uh, when kappa is a fixed point of the bet function, any logic that is nice in the sense of having natural closure properties, you know, closing under, under uh, you know, negation and uh, basic constructions whose occurrence number is less than or equal to kappa. This is related to Gunther's uh, question, uh, of course. That is a, an upper bound of L theta plus omega for theta less than kappa. And that satisfies this strong undefinability will order. It will be bounded above by L1 kappa. So this is a kind of Lindstrom-like uh, theorem. Um, the, um, you know, uh, uh, it is proved in a you know it is proved in a kind of similar way to the classical Lindstrom type uh, theorems, but one has to replace the use of compactness by this uh, undefinability of an order. So anyway, let me just um, uh, now skip to our second logic because we are you know running short of time, perhaps. So. I think it was crucial to understand this construction of L1 kappa and see the problem that it didn't have a recursive syntax. So we will define a logic that is called Cartagena logic. That's a place where this, uh, you know, the original ideas where 
uh, you know, discussed for, for the first time, uh, I think, yeah, in 2018. So L1C kappa has a recursive syntax. It is smaller than L1 kappa, but it shares many, not all, but many of the nice properties of L1 kappa. And the distance between the two logics is not large. It is exactly the delta operator I want to say something about later. So let me just try the syntax. Suppose to, to take the formulas of our new logic will be built from atomic formulas and their negations. So we start with atomic formulas and their negations uh, by means of you know, bounded um, uh, conjunction and disjunction. So for you know for set of indices less than kappa. So so far it is clearly you know it, it will contain L kappa omega in some sense, or or the union of all the you know the way we described L kappa omega. But we will also allow some infinitary quantification of the following form. Now, what I want to stress is that we iterate. So let me just say what it is, and then we look at examples and we look at the game. I mean, we, we can compare, we also have a game for this logic that allows us to compare it with Schellach's logic in a kind of more direct way or you know, in, in some sense. So suppose you have, for all subsets of theta, you have formulas that you have already constructed, phi, a, x, y. And the variables x, you know, they range up to theta. Uh, but the, the convention is that when you use phi a, we only use those uh, indices for which, uh, you know, um, only those indices for which the, the alpha is, a, is an element of a occurs free in, in, the, in the formula. Now, what is this first uh, new construction chain? Well, it's saying anytime you take take some x of uh, cardinality, yeah, I say it uh, below, less than or equal to theta, there will be some function, so some function from theta prime, so that's the length of the, of the x into omega. And remember Schellach's partitions in the Schellach game. We, 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 we're, we're actually saying that, in, or saying part of that here, there will be a way to split the variables into omega many chunks, such that for each one of the elements, for so for each natural number, uh, the formula associated, you know, phi f to the minus one, so, so that's the preimage of this n will be a subset of a uh, holds x and y, and the dual construction. The second one is just the dual construction to the previous one, but the previous one is kind of more perhaps you know similar to to the game. So stopping here, I think it is quite clear from this description that we are in between L kappa omega and L kappa kappa. So this contains L kappa omega, by, you know, by the, the first part of this. And these are specific constructs. I mean, a very one, one could ask the question, I mean, don't you already capture the whole of L kappa kappa? But no, this is quite controlled as we will see. Now, you know, leave the, the forms here and we define L1C kappa as the union of all, of all of these logics. And um, it's worth mentioning that some formulas of such formulas are all, you know, are the phi A for A, a subset of theta prime, theta prime less than theta here. So less than or equal to theta. Anyway, yeah, but this is for specific theta. Okay, let me just say very quickly that one can capture things like cardinality quantifiers. So the logic is, you know, it has some power. And uh, so here's, it's like an exercise to check why this specific form, I mean, you can see that it follows the format that I was describing. And this says that the predicate P has to be smaller than theta. And it also has, the way to express that there are no long chains, descending chains. There are no long descending chains. And you could say, oh, wait a minute, isn't this undefinability of order? Almost. No omega 
descending chains is undefined mutable order. But here, what you can say is that there are no theta descending chains. It is kind of subtle that you cannot define real order, yet you cannot say, I don't have any long descending chains in this particular logic. Now, I, I have not claimed that it has undefined mutable order, but I have claimed that it is bounded by Shellac's logic. So if Shellac's logic cannot define world order, this, this one here should not be able to define world order. Let me skip this. I think this, uh, this is kind of more technical. This is very important for the combinatorial core. And this will be important also in the, you know, in the, in the forcing connection. But I want to give you the game of the logic because I think it is, I mean, if you got Shellac's game, looking at this game, will allow you to at least see how uh, you know, the comparison has changed. So you have here M and N just as before. The game will have exactly the same parameters. The C here is just to, you know, to, to, to say that it is the Cartagena game, the new game for the new logic. And uh, so the first player, anti, also plays beta. Sorry, beta zero, uh, less than beta, and some challenge. So I, you know, I, I use exactly the same drawing here so far. It's exactly the same kind of challenge bounded by theta in, in size. Uh, Iso does exactly the same thing that she was supposed to do in the former game. So she splits into omega many parts, fine. But remember before, she split it in a way that will delay, would delay the new uh, moves. Now, the first player, and anti-isomorphism player gets to choose. So he says, oh, okay, look at this. I want you to respond to this particular number. So he chooses a natural number. That's the, you know, the disjunction or the natural numbers that we had. I want you to look at this particular natural number because I know that that's, I mean, you, 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 you made your selection, but you will have to respond exactly to this one here. So it's not like a delay anymore, a delay anymore. So Izu, well, she has to respond with a partial isomorphism of that piece. But after that is done, everything is dealt with in the A0. She doesn't have to, I mean, the next move is a new challenge, A1. So in a way, the first challenge is lost at this point. Of course, the first player could go on, you know, selecting the same A0 and selecting some other numbers to play. But uh, the, the way the game unfolds is for the new challenge, there will be a new partition in, in green. Also, as before, I forgot to say it, but uh, the ordinal clock is ticking down and um, he gets to select a piece, for instance, this one here. She has to respond to that particular piece and nothing else. Of course, G0, G1, all of this has to be you know, compatible as a partial isomorphism. New challenge, a new partition. In red, the first player has a new selection. He says, OK, I want this particular piece of your partition. And the isomorphism player has to respond if she wants to continue being in the game with some partial isomorphism that, let us call it G2. That you know everything is compatible with the previous one. So the, the union of G zero, G one, G two, and so on is still um, partial isomorphism, and the clock is ticking down. So as before, it is a finite game, and you can you know perhaps uh, compare at least. Uh, well, there are several things to prove. First of all, why is this game exactly the same thing as this syntactical description that we gave? So there is a theorem, the following are equivalent. Player two has a winning strategy and M and N satisfy the same sentences that, that we actually built you know, in a concrete way of this logic of quantifier rank up to beta. So the ordinal clock is really the quantifier rank in this, in this sense. But now you see how this complex definition of Schellach has been kind of redu reduced to something that is much more, I think, Approachable. I don't think it is better or worse. I, I like the game definition because I got used to it, and now, at least for you know, for the purpose of, of the comparison today, I think the game definition, at least, uh, I have the impression. I don't know if you agree 
that uh, it allows one to, to see a little bit of what's going on. Now, this game, because of this theorem, for instance, now it is really uh, a, a transitive uh, relation that was not true in the, in the Schellach case. And the uh, corollary of this theorem is that L1C kappa is bounded by L1 kappa. And another theorem, and let me just uh, kind of get to the, the end of, of, of my lecture today, is that when kappa is a fixed point of the bed function, the delta closure, the delta closure is essentially, you know, I, I have a slide where I say exactly what it is, but to make it essentially closed for interpolation is L1 kappa. So L1C kappa fails interpolation, which was our first motivation. But in many ways, maybe it's important to say this, that, um, you know, what is delta of logic? So here's uh, really, you know, the model class is sigma of the logic, which is the class of relativized reduct of an L definable model class. And uh, it is delta if both the class K and its complement are sigma. So it's, uh, that's mean delta. And uh, well, Suslin and Klein showed this for, for L omega omega. So any, any delta definition, any class that is delta in first order is, all, is already the final in first order. It is a theorem, I don't know by whom, but maybe someone here knows for that the same thing happens for, delta, for L omega one omega. It is a closure operator in the sense that uh, delta of delta is equal to delta, but it also preserves compactness, exomatizability, Longham's quantum properties. It, it is perceived uh, in abstract model theory as some sort of a operator that doesn't change too much the logic. It is kind of a neighborhood operator. There is also Sorry, a unit level. Andreas, in yes. Before you go on, I don't think I understood uh, that sigma L concept. Can you? Sorry? I, I I didn't understand uh, this notion uh, of a model class being si sigma L. Okay. So again? suppose you have a nice definition in some tau prime that extends tau. And, but now you have some sigma that is really a class of tau structures. So you may have a situation where it is not definable. You know, it is not, uh, sorry, K. K is a class of mod structures. So it may be, it may very well happen that K is not uh, definable. Sorry. Yeah, so K is, is not of the form mod uh, phi for any phi in uh, written, you know, tau sentence. But it may be that K consists of all the, well, let me put this in parentheses and just look at the reduct. All the reduct of M, and let me call them M prime to tau, such that M prime is a model of this subside. So it may happen that your language, your vocabulary is too poor to actually define your class. So your class is written in the poor vocabulary, but somebody, somebody else has you know, access to a richer vocabulary that is called tau prime that extends your original vocabulary. There, they have a definition. There are many examples of that mathematics where you, you, know, you, you know, oh, to define this kind of function, I need these additional symbols. But being sigma of L means being of this form, essentially. I'm ignoring this part here for, you know, for, for the sake of, because I think this is the most important part of this uh, uh, thing. So that means there is an existential, so maybe I should say, there is a second order existential quantifier of this form. There exists some vocabulary extending the original vocabulary tau such that the class is actually you know, uh, the, uh, the class of models of some, and there exists some psi in tau prime, such that the class is the class of models of tau prime, but relativized to the original vocabulary tau. Does that uh, clarify um, the notion, uh, Vika? Yes, I, it's, I, it's perfect now. Okay. Now, it may Thank happen you. that the class and the complement of the class, so not being in the class, are both the final, you know, one with some tau prime, the other one with some tau double prime. And when both things happen, that's being a delta. And, uh, you know, the Suslin-Klein-Kleini theorem 
says that the first order has this property, but in general, a logic won't have it. So this is this is a very important thing, and uh, I think may play an, an interesting uh, role in the connections that uh, you might be interested in. Let me speak, skip over the union property, just say that just like Sherlock's logic, there is a union property. Here it is even better because we don't need to go to a stronger logic. We have the union property in itself. So this is, I skip the proof of the union lemma. It is playing with games. I mean, the, the nicest way of doing the proof here is with, with the games, but a consequence of the union lemma, and I close with this, or almost close with this today, is that, well, actually, that's how we prove that the delta of uh, the Cartagena logic is Shellac's logic. And you can prove also Lohenheim's calling theorems that I mentioned. And the finite weak well order is also true here. I mean, if it is bounded by some logic that doesn't define well order, you know a priori that it won't be able to define well order, but there is a direct proof, which is also nice to, to have here, because you see things in that proof. And um, delta of L1 C kappa contains any logic that satisfies the union lemma. That, and that's that's one, one interesting thing. So these are just you know finer grained connections. But the advantages of this L1 C kappa are simple syntax. Well, simple, I don't know. I mean, you could argue whether that's, but compared to saying that a sentence is a, an arbitrary union of less than bet something of, of some equivalence classes of some relation that is a transitive closure of some game. Well, here we actually have uh, sentences, but this logic can express in an implicit way because of the delta uh, connection, what L1 kappa does. Everything that is definable actually in L1 kappa is here you know, implicitly definable in that sense. And it's delta extension has Craig and Lindstrom, as Shella proved. And there is another connection. There is a third proof of undefinability world order by using Caicedo's theorem on rigid structures and uniform reason. But this is something that's uh, maybe, you know, maybe next time. So thank you so much. Until next week, we continue. Thanks very much, Andreas, for the great talk. I, I, I really enjoyed it. I, I only didn't, didn't understand at that last bit that I asked you about. Because I, never, I, I think you mentioned the notion uh, at your talk at CUNY, and I didn't understand it then, so I figured I would ask this time. OK, OK, yeah. I think, yeah, there was a mention of the Delta. Yeah, that's right. I, mm -hmm. I don't remember, but, but now I, I hope that now it made more sense. And, and I think it may play a role in the you know, in the extension, when you, when you look for, you know, elementary extensions of models of set theory or, you know, virtual uh, versions of these cardinals and so on, those notions might actually become quite important. I, I, yeah, I, 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 imagine... mm -hmm. I vaguely see the connection. I see what you're saying. I also vaguely see a connection so far. My plan is to perhaps next week see it less vaguely. I think it is, you know, the paper by you for the four authors is, is fascinating to me, uh, maybe because it combines several different things that I have been interested uh, for different reasons also. And also has virtual cardinals and you also have, uh, well, they are not originally defined with that paper, but uh, they are, I think, uh, quite natural and close to some of our works. But, uh, but it also has the notion of pseudo laws that I think is an important notion in a, that goes beyond what, uh, I don't know, is, is there much more known about pseudo models, uh, Vika? Not at the, not at the moment. Okay. So I okay. think that the, I, I actually, I have an updated dra draft of the paper, but it's mainly just fixing stuff. Okay. So it okay. doesn't have too much new stuff in it. But, but these, the, they don't appear in some, you know, somewhere else, in some or paper by someone else, or it's, no. it's really, okay. No, this is okay. completely, I, we were just looking for some way of characterizing virtual lar large cardinals. And while playing with it, I was like, okay, there's this notion that seems to be, keep coming up. This seems like okay. the only natural thing to do here, but unfortunately, I don't know. I would love to have application, but. Okay. I, yeah. So uh, I, I cannot promise much more. I mean, I, next, next week, I hope.
to be able to single out some additional uh, maybe lemmas or maybe constructions or I don't really you know I hope to have some idea and some you know like uh, some new theorem connecting these two things but I think it is a little bit too uh, uh, ambitious in the, in the in the short time uh, that, that there is but um, uh, I just want to single out these logics they are they have extremely interesting behavior and they're strong compactness so uh, and this is something much more new I mean today we we only looked at the case kappa is singular of capillarity omega and maybe fixed point of bet and that's it but uh, uh, if you use the same kind of definitions, but now with Kappa being a strongly compact cardinal, uh, then you, you start uh, seeing different things. I think it is connected in the end, but this is kind of conjectural to, I don't know, how you go from singular compactness to the sort of compactness that you have in strong compactness. I mean, they seem to go, you know, singular versus strong, uh, strong compact, yet, so how this logic seems to give you ways of seeing the, the transfer between these two things. Uh, incidentally, maybe, um, you know, this logic is also close to the logic of abstract elementary classes, the L1 kappa. It's very close. So that explains perhaps, you know, kind of a posteriori why it is good for model theory. But um, the logic for abstract elementary, so what I wanted to say is that Mackay's paper with Shellac was the first paper where uh, there was actually good model theory for abstract elementary classes. And there they assumed a strongly compact card. And that's not a coincidence. I mean, it is exactly the sort of place where you would start looking at uh, good behavior for abstract elementary classes. You know, just assume it is defined in some L kappa kappa or L kappa omega, or at least in the paper. And then it's a very beautiful blend of pure after elementary class ideas plus the power of the strong compact cardinal. Then, of course, later, many of the, of the consequences of being strongly compact were removed until all extra you know, non-ZFC uh, uh, assumptions were removed or almost, you know, you remain just weak GCH or something like that. But... Um, oh. Sorry, I think sound went off. No, no, it's it's okay. Okay. I just stopped sharing. Yeah. I got some some strange message from the computer here. Anyway, yeah. um, so it is perhaps not a coincidence that uh, you know it started with like a strongly compact cardinals, it kind of went away from there. But now we can look at the logic and look at the logic again. Uh, you know, as connected to large cardinals. Since well, there is your paper, and uh, so. That's the plan for next week. I hope there'll be something new to say. Yeah. All right. Um, any questions for Andreas? I, I have a question way back at the beginning. So this may be trivial, but I'll ask it anyway. Uh, when you were showing how to, showing that one of these uh, gain described logics is less than or equal to an infinitary logic with nice big subscripts. So essentially yes. this- Let me try to put the slide. I have to share the screen again. I, I, I'm not gonna say anything specific about the subscripts, so we don't really need to see them. <laughs> uh, okay. what, I, what I really want to ask is much smaller subscripts. Namely, is, is this essentially like the construction of Scott sentences Describing games in much lower context. Yes. The yes, yes. In, in, you need to make the Scott type construction. Yes. More. In in uh, in. Uh, of course, I mean there, there is a long way from uh, you know understanding as, you, as 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 you have said that you have to do some kind of stock uh, Scott like construction or description. And uh, making it actually work oh, yeah. for the sort of game we have here, and so on. So we, the there is a long induction, but but I think the core of the construction is really it's really a I don't know if there is a name for that. Uh, and this is something I'd like to discuss also with Paul Larson, and uh, because he has been looking at Scott-like constructions, and that, uh, and uh, incidentally, uh, 
there is also a question that they completely you know, ignored today of how you define abstract elementary classes, what kind of, and in a way, what you have to do is, again, for the abstract elementary class, look at the systems of embeddings and make some kind of Scott-like uh, description for them. So these are all adaptations of that uh, same idea. Thank you very much for bringing this up because that light, that, that gives a lot of light uh, to that, uh, that specific comparison between the two logics. Thank you. Anyone else? I asked in the chat what language your second thank you was, your, your FIE and Zynga, something like this on your phone. Oh, uh, I was thinking of when you said what language, I was thinking of. Oh, yes, of course. Right, right, right. Yeah. Okay, okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It, uh, so, well, uh, it, it is a local language that was spoken here uh, by millions of people until the 18th century when it what, got, um, I think, culturally wiped away mm. by the Spaniards uh, back then. So, um, well, essentially, you know, the same phenomenon has happened in many other places that uh, the families themselves start uh, telling their children, don't speak, you know, the Muisca language because that won't get you anywhere in this society, speak Spanish. And then after uh, a while, it disappears. So it disappeared. But the Spaniards uh, allow now to reconstruct it because they kept extremely detailed records. Because at some point, there was a project of, uh, uh, you know, converting people and they realized they needed to, you know, priests to speak in the, uh, in the Muisca language. So, you know, that's a very Spanish thing to, they wrote, you know, parts of the Bible, parts of the, everything, a lot of the manuals of behavior, good behavior, bad behavior. And uh, uh, as you know, the result of that is that now linguists are now being able, it, it's, a, it's a very slow reconstruction, but uh, it, is, it is happening now. There are dictionaries and there are grammars of uh, that language. Uh, and I find it interesting. I, I, I started learning a little bit of that language during the pandemic, so. Do people know pronunciation uh, or only is it strictly written? Or? It, that's a very, you know, I have these discussions with it because there are different sources by different times, uh, like 50 year different times. The spelling in, in Spanish was changing at the time. Oh. So like some X that was pronounced like sh uh, or maybe H or maybe, and then they start kind of uh, interpolating between these two different things. And then they say the most likely way of pronouncing this, because it's all written in Spanish. I mean, all these grand, all these, vocabularies and Bibles and so on, they, they, they're meant to be read by Spanish speakers of the, of the eight, 17th century, 18th century. Then it is possible because people, because people know roughly how, what was the, the Spanish pronunciation back then, they can actually approximate it. And the fact of having, there are four or five different sources uh, in libraries in Madrid and here in Bogota, and uh, it's, it's possible to do quite good approximation by interpolation of different sources. Really. But, but these questions are, very, are difficult. I, I'm not a linguist, I'm just you know, a beginning learn, learner of that. So, Was this a written language back then or only a spoken no. language? Spoken. No. No. Okay. They had some kind of a basic symbols that are written in stones in some places, and, but more like glyphs of some sort. And the, they guess some connections, but... Um, the problem is that the cultural, uh, you know, kind of a attitude was very difficult, and uh, after a few generations, even people who had been, you know, maybe like the scholars of that society, had been kind of uh, converted into, you know, the, just the workers who would uh, hopefully, you know, work in land or something like that, and they were treated as uh, uh, ignorant people and so on. And the, the Spaniards say, "Well, we're bringing you." Uh, what we have to read. The exception is some some of the Spanish priests actually understood that a little bit better what they were doing, and it is thanks to them that we can now reconstruct the language or they, you know, the linguists, right. not me, but the linguists, 
can can now try to reconstruct the language. And the Fien Chinga, of course, means uh, uh, thank you, thank you, thank you much. Yes. Okay. 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 Well, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Fien Chinga. Yeah. Okay. Anyone yeah. else? It, Andres, thank, thank you again for the great talk. Yes, and looking forward to next week very much. Okay, hopefully it'll be interesting. Thank you. Thank you very thank much. You. Well then. Good to see you. Bye-bye. Yeah, very good to see you again.